Complete the following two tasks. Firstly, breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. That was task one. The second task, touch the sky. Wave your hands and please sit down. So my job is to finish off this session and uh, talk a little about safety one and safety two and the resilience of healthcare. So I'd like to do that now. So I'm Geoffrey Braithwaite and I run the Australian Institute of Health Innovation. And we're about 150 people who do health systems research. My joke is that we don't splice genes or try and cure cancer. We do something much more complex than that. We try and research the health system, understand how it works, and then work out ways with that knowledge to try and improve the care delivered to patients. That, I think, is a mission statement that we all share. We're trying to improve the way care is delivered to patients. And that's our mission, and you will have your mission. So there's three of us who run the Institute. We're interested in e-health and big data and how care is delivered to patients and safety of patients. So you should start maybe a talk, I don't know, with reference to William Shakespeare or some other person in your country who said something really important that encapsulates what you want to achieve. Here's my starting point. After decades of improving the healthcare system, patients still receive care that's highly variable, frequently inappropriate, and too often unsafe. Who agrees with that statement? Many people in the audience, perhaps all of us do, but perhaps we didn't want to put our hands up. Now that is the statement after we've spent concerted effort for maybe 30 years, well, the entire history of medicine, but maybe 30 years trying to keep patients safe. And we can still agree, many of us, with a statement like that. That tells us something immediately, that the problem we are trying to solve is not a trivial problem. It's not a problem of just saying, we need more leadership, we need more teamwork. It's much more a wicked problem than that. And many speakers from Lord Darcy and Victor and other people have indicated that very eloquently this morning. So we're all grappling with this hugely wicked and difficult problem. You can summarize it many ways and people have already. Here's my summary. About 60% of care is delivered in line with level one evidence or consensus-based guidelines. 30% of care on many estimates is wasteful. Maybe surgery that doesn't take, shouldn't take place or there are non-Kaizen features in hospitals. Uh, there are lots of ways that we don't deliver care optimally in terms of high reliability. And perhaps, as we've heard, the rate of adverse events is hovering at 10%. Maybe it's more, depends how we measure. Now, that's an incredibly difficult problem. If we just pause with that slide, 60, 30, 10, if we could just improve those numbers in any hospital, region, entire country, or the world, we would have done marvelously. But we've heard from Victor and Lord Darcy and other speakers Maybe it's even worse than that. Maybe it's even harder than this. For example, harm due to medication safety alone costs Australia approximately $1.2 billion, 100 million yen annually. That may seem small to some of the larger countries when they mobilise their numbers, which I'm always shocked at at conferences such as this. So the economic burden as well as the burden on the health system. So what are we doing about that? Well, we're doing a lot of things stimulated by IHI and Don Berwick and other people across the world. Root cause analysis, hand hygiene, medication safety, accreditation. In fact, if I was to list all the things that we have designed to try and improve care to patients and put them all on a post-it sticker, I wouldn't stop going around the room probably several times, would I? There are many, many things that we've designed with our smart brains to try and tackle patient safety, to improve the systems that we'd like to preside over in Canada or the US or Japan. 
We've also been looking lately at, should we be looking at delivering value rather than just more patient safety programs? Should we be looking at the outcomes that we deliver to patients and be more focused on that, as clinicians are often to individual patients? OECD last year unveiled a fantastic report led by Nick Klasinger, showing the kinds of interventions that are best bang for the buck, take in an economic view to say these are the kinds of interventions, they're really bundles of care that would deliver good impact in your health system for a lower cost than other things that you might do. That's a very good hint of an agenda that we should be looking at within countries. But let me scale that back. Let me start, let me go back to the starting point, the point I started with. Let me look fundamentally at how we do things in healthcare. We have a mental model, and that's to do with the architecture of the brain too. Cognitively, it's not just that we can't concentrate for more than an hour and a half without fiddling with our iPhones or doing our email. And that's true, is it not? I'm sure not during this talk. But perhaps during some other talks this afternoon, you might do that. But essentially, we've got an architecture of the brain that is attracted to cause and effect and hierarchical thinking. So if your mental model looks like this, and you see this in healthcare and on websites all over the place, at the country level, at the hospital level, or whatever, if your mental model looks like this, then you'll say something like, well, if I do something at the top of a system and filter it down, then it'll affect the front lines of care, and they'll be deliver delivering care differently. And we're all attracted to that mental model. So if you have a mental model like this, and we all do some of the time, many of us most of the time, this is how you'll deal with error. You'll be attracted to Jim Reason's Swiss cheese model, or a model that says, let's sort out what the problems are and the symptoms and tackle both. Or, if I do one thing, it'll be like dominoes, and I'll eventually get to the end, and I'll have done something differently. But healthcare doesn't look like that um, organization chart in reality. Healthcare looks like this. <laughs> and anybody on the front lines of care knows this intrinsically. So it's not really like that organizational chart, is it? Even though that's what we use to describe the way healthcare is delivered, or the way patient care flows, patient, patient safety decisions flow. Healthcare really looks like this. On the front lines of care, that's what it looks like. And that means that maybe we have a categorical error. Maybe what we're doing is taking a linear approach and saying, let's do things differently to the front lines of care, when in fact, people's lives on the front line of care is very, very complex and very, very difficult. Maybe they can't absorb the next policy or idea we design about how to keep patients safe or procedure or guideline. Maybe they can't absorb that anymore. And I want to make it even more difficult, if that's already difficult enough, let me make it even more difficult. It's extremely hard to make large-scale change at the re hospital, regional, or country level. Now, I'm not telling you anything new, am I? Here's just one example from a whole range of studies I could draw on. It's the North Carolina study, New England Journal of Medicine, Landrigan, 2010. It showed concerted effort for six years in North Car Carolina hospitals trying to measure the rate of adverse events and change them. And if you can see a difference in the curve, it started to get a bit better but ended up where it was after, after six years of concerted effort. And we can show many, many studies like that. So doing large scale systems change is extremely difficult. So we've been thinking, me and a number of colleagues across the world um, have been thinking, well, can we think of patient safety differently? Can we do patient safety differently from the way we've been doing it? And that's a very hard thing to do because everyone's trapped in a paradigm which we've called safety one. We're also looking at, is there a difference in thinking between those who do what we've called work as imagined, imagining how care occurs on the front lines of care, compared to people remote from the front lines of care who are trying to affect change on it? And is there a difference in those doing work as imagined and those doing work on the clinical front lines. So let me just take those two examples in the limited time I have. Rates of harm seem to have flatlined at about 
depends how you measure it. If you use the global trigger tool, and we've published a systematic review on this, then you'll find perhaps more harm or more adverse events or more near misses. But let's say it's 10%. And so let's say we need new ideas because it's remained 10% for 30 years. That's not to say healthcare isn't doing well, by the way. We can do many, many things to patients uh, than we could 30 years ago, and we treat many more aged and sicker patients. However, all I'm saying is the rates that I of change, the rates of, of uh, uh, adverse events, the rates of harm, seems to have flatlined across 30 years. So, we've been looking at the natural characteristics of healthcare on the front lines of care. And it's highly resilient in most places. That is, healthcare adjusts its functioning. Clinicians in teams, in microsystems, adjust their functioning before, during, and after changes and disturbances, whether they be good ones or bad ones, and sustain operations under expected or unexpected conditions. What I'm saying is, we focused on the 10% of harm and errors for 30 years, but perhaps what we've under-recognized is the 90% of cases where there is no harm, where care is delivered Maybe not as well as we'd like, maybe fantastically, but there's no harm attaching to that care. And that's an interesting problem. You see, I think the amazing thing about healthcare isn't that it produces harm in 10% of cases. I think an equally amazing fact about healthcare is that in a system this complex, as shown by the swirly diagram, or represented by the swirly diagram I showed, produces safe care in 90% of cases. That's unbelievable, and yet it's relatively under-examined. It's relatively not researched. So that's very interesting. So we coined these terms, safety one and safety two, me and some other people. Bob Weir's in Florida, Eric Holnagel in, uh, in uh, Denmark, who's really the, uh, the grandfather of this. And safety one and safety two says, what we've been doing now is largely under a safety one umbrella. Let's try and reduce harm to patients. Safety two says, what about the care that gets delivered that has no harm attached to it? Shouldn't we understand that as well? Shouldn't we understand that as well, or as, uh, as much? So safety one is where the number of adverse events is as low as possible, and we've been working on that for 30 years, trying to stamp out harm. Trying to make things sure things don't go wrong. And that's most of what we've been doing, root cause analysis, accreditation, standards, hand hygiene. But why don't we look also at where the number of acceptable outcomes is as high as possible, trying to make sure things go right. So for example, if we do an RCA, if, if one of Lord Darcy's surgeons uh, creates an error uh, next week, we, and it's serious enough to do a root cause analysis, then we look back and say, well, why did that occur and let's make sure it doesn't happen again. But maybe we should ask a second question. How many times did Lord Darcy's surgeon do that procedure and that exact same, more or less, process before and it went right? What can we learn from that? Maybe that surgeon did that 100 times and got it right. And this one time, when it goes wrong, we create a root cause analysis and have a major inquiry, but we don't ask that second question. How come it went right so many times in the past? We would learn a lot more about the system, perhaps, because maybe the error occurred and it's an aberration of the system. Maybe learning how many times the system does things right is a powerful second question. And that's what we call safety two. So few people have looked at why things go right so often. In fact, saying that sentence sounds a bit strange to a patient safety audience. We're so rusted on to looking at why did things go wrong. I don't want to be melodramatic, but sometimes it seems to me we've been standing at the bottom of a cliff, waiting for patients to fall off the cliff, counting them, putting the number into an incident reporting system, and then saying, we must find out why this happens so often. We haven't been on top of the cliff saying, can we prevent the patients from falling in the first place as much as I would like? Perhaps that's too evocative, perhaps that's too controversial, but it's worth thinking about. The second thing I said I'd talk about briefly is work as imagined, work as done. We've just published a book on this, the third in the series on our books on resilient healthcare. And we've been looking at 
Is there a difference between all the people who are doing work as imagined, and I include myself in that when I'm doing research, I'm imagining how things occur on the front lines of care and trying to invent new studies, new ideas to improve uh, safety on the, on the front lines of care. But if you do work as imagined, say you're a policymaker or a manager, if you do work as imagined, your effort is going to take years, at best months, or maybe weeks to take effect, if you're lucky, if it takes any effect at all. On the other hand, people on the front lines of care, their currency isn't years or months or weeks. The average length of stay in most health systems is a few days. If you're in an ambulatory setting, you get cared for there and then. So maybe there's the difference between what people are trying to do work as imagined and what happens on the front lines of care, which is represented by the swirly diagram. And people don't deliver care like it's suggested they do in guidelines or in procedures, standard operating procedures, etc. They do workarounds all the time with IT systems and the way they deliver care. Healthcare is a complex adaptive system delivered by people on the front line who flex and adjust to the circumstances. So here's some examples. A glove over, uh, over a smoke alarm because the nebulizers kept going off. Um, uh, leg strap holding up on IV, plastic bags placed over shoes because they'd run out of Wellington boots or gum boots. People do workarounds all the time. So let me finish with a couple of points. One is, I don't think we can claim things like, after 25 years of evidence-based medicine, care is evidence-based. Because it's not. This is one study we've just done, published Care Track Kids. You'll be interested, Don, because you're a, you were a pediatrician. Care Track Kids. Uh, looking at how much of care is in line with level one evidence or consensus-based guidelines in Australia, it's about 60%. So my conclusions. Maybe we should be looking at as much as at when care goes right to understand the system when it produces good care, as we do with all our efforts to try and look at when things go wrong, which is where mostly we've concentrated our efforts in patient safety. And maybe we need a more balanced view of the health system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Can we ask the panelists to join us up here on stage now? <coughs> well, let me thank the panelists first. The work for the work you put into this, the eloquent and uh, just uh, provocative thoughts you've shared. I've got thousands of questions myself. Um, the way Chris and I will do this is I'm gonna ask one question to one or two of you. Chris will ask a question, and then you in the audience, please get a question ready. We'd love to have your participation and know what's 